Warning! The following video contains excessive zombie violence and gore, and even little bits of partial female nudity. If you are offended by such things, then don't watch this video. To be honest, why did you even click on the link in the first place, you bloody fool? Anyway, please move on. You have been warned. It's that time of year again where the dead walk leads. Well, between the cinema and the pub at least. It's the fifth lead zombie film festival. A gathering of zombie lovers, although not literally, that would be disgusting, in order to watch six gortastic zombie movies back to back in order to support the WSPA, the World Society for the Protection of Animals. And of course, it's all organised by Dominic Brunt and Mark Charnock, otherwise known as Marlon and Paddy from Emmerdale. I am the Big Daddy D, and this is the fifth Leeds Zombie Film Festival. First on the list, Pontypool. From looking at the title, you will be forgiven for thinking, a Welsh zombie movie? Hmm, that's something different. Turns out though that it's not actually Welsh, it's Canadian. But it still is something very different. I actually saw this on DVD in Poundland a few months ago when I was doing my Halloween Poundland special and I immediately regret buying Resident Evil De Regeneration instead of this now. Based on the award-winning novel Pontypool Changes Everything by Tony Burgess, this film treads similar zombie-related ground by having a virus that changes the inhabitants of a small town into homicidal maniacs. Okay, so far so good. But then, there's a truly mind-twisting, um, twist to this. And the infection in question isn't spread by a zombie bite, but by certain words in the English language becoming corrupted, including, but not excluding, terms of endearment. So, don't be phoning up your loved ones, because chances are you might end up using a word like honey, or sweetheart, or darling, and turning them into zombies as well. Don't! The thing about Pontypool is that because most of the drama takes place is audio rather than visual based, this would actually work as a radio play, or even as a stage show in a theatre. This could have been the first ever zombie based stage show, if Evil Dead the musical hadn't got there first. This really is a game changer as far as zombie movies are concerned, as in you hardly see the undead hordes at all, but you certainly hear them. Pontypool is a great example of how to do a horror movie when you're lacking in budget but have bags of imagination. And it's a must see. And there's a movie that you're going to have a job trying to sell to us. Even Dom and Mark had a bit of a job trying to sell the movie to us. The best way, to, the best way I can really say to describe Pony Pool, you need to sit down and give it a go. Either you'll like it or you'll love it. It's kind of like the Marmite of zombie movies, if you like. But at the same time, it is trying something very different indeed. You might like it. Some guys here liked it. I personally loved it. I thought it was brilliant. They were doing something different. It was a zombie virus that was spread by the, zombie, by the language being spoken. It's different. All I can say about Ponty Pool is give it a go. You'll either like it, you'll either, you'll either hate it, or you'll love it. Next up, though, we're going to have something a little bit more different again. It's going to be some Japanese supernatural martial arts zombie flick, Versus. Next up, from the Far East, comes Versus, a Japanese supernatural martial arts zombie movie. So, it covers quite a few genres, then. And don't let the fact that it's got subtitles put you off, as the film is essentially one huge fight scene after another. Versus is full of those moments where you think, fucking hell, that kicked ass. As martial arts, lots of guns, lots of zombies, and bucket loads of blood and gore go flying across the screen. And yes, the zombies have guns as well. You don't tend to see the zombies shooting back at you, do you? Well, you're doing this. A group of gangsters find themselves in the Forest of Resurrection, a place that acts as a portal between this world and the next. Here, they find themselves forced to contend with the men they had previously killed and buried in the forest that are now becoming reanimated as gun-toting zombies. One of my favourite scenes in Versus is where the main bad guy is telling off one of his zombie lackeys for not stopping the main hero or kidnapping his girl. To get his point across, he punches his fist all the way through the zombie's head. 
And if that wasn't enough, when he pulls his hand back out, he has a good look at his handiwork. Maybe he lost a ring in there or something. Oh yeah, he also gets the zombie's eyeball stuck on his fingers. This is always a bit of a bugger when you're trying to punch cleanly through someone's head. So we've just had verses. What did we think of verses? <laughs> make a lot of money back. <laughs> Next up, Dead Set, the critically acclaimed BAFTA-nominated horror drama spawned from the dark imagination of Charlie Brooker. In a scenario borrowed from Dawn of the Dead, with the survivors living in a secure compound, the twist here is that the compound in question is the Big Brother house, with all the housemates blissfully unaware that the rest of the country is rather more concerned with the small matter of a mysterious zombie plague sweeping across Britain. And because this is the Big Brother house, the characters are mostly obnoxious, thunderously stupid or ignorant, extremely annoying and completely weird. Or usually a combination of one of those uh, charming character traits. There is little or no real backstory for any of these characters, although some of them do appear to be based off real life Big Brother contestants. So what's this power cup? Can you eat them frozen? Uh, if it's a power cup, they'll defrost. What, and you'll eat them cold and mushy? For the first time. Okay. The only characters that seem to have any depth to them are the main protagonist, Kelly, along with the foul-mouthed, ranting Big Brother producer, Patrick, who provided some much-needed comic relief along the way, as this does get very bleak and dark at times. Especially the ending, which I won't spoil for you. As a character, Patrick is far more than just a straightforward villain. He is a man who is only out for himself. Whether it's doing whatever it takes to get the ratings, such as manipulating the housemates to stir up conflict, or doing whatever it takes to escape the zombies, such as using a man in a wheelchair as a barricade. He certainly isn't a hero, but in this world gone mad, he is able to adapt to the harsh realities of survival a lot better than anyone else. Dead Set doesn't hold back on the gore either, as throats are ripped out, intestines are chewed upon, and heads are smashed to a bloody pulp with fire extinguishers. Mmm, lovely stuff. But like any good zombie flick, there's plenty of social commentary in there amongst the blood and gore. Indeed, the sight of the Big Brother fans before they get turned into the undead is terrifying enough, with their screaming and yelling and waving of homemade signs like a lynch mob. They fail to realise that the situations and people they're getting mad at have all been engineered or created by the TV producers intentionally in order to invoke these reactions. In other words, they were a bunch of mindless zombies already. They're dead. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Shut up! This is not happening. They're dead. You're right. Is this thing you're not on telly anymore? We're going to get a trailer for Dominic Brunt's much-anticipated zombie movie, Before Dawn. Now, what was funny about this was that uh, when the trailer started, there was no sound to begin with. Just a load of aerial photography there of, of the Yorkshire Moors, which looked suspiciously like a certain soap opera. Needless to say, quite a few of us in the audience all started singing the uh, Emmerdale theme tune, which was brilliant, really spontaneous. Da -da -da -da, da -da 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 we got to see the trailer, and we also got to see a couple of scenes as well including a particularly intensive fight scene between Dominic himself and a particularly rabid looking zombie. In a way this kind of looks like uh, The Horde, which was um, shown at last year's zombie film festival, only set in the Yorkshire Dales, if you can imagine that. The uh, zombie and gore makeup effects look absolutely fantastic, but not much of a surprise really because they're done by the creative geniuses that are two baldies FX. Clearly, this is a, a labour of love, it's a film that's been made by zombie fans, for zombie fans. And we were just cheering all the way through the trailer and through the, uh, and through the clips that were being shown. As soon as it was finished, we thought, we have got to have this for next year's Leeds Zombie Film Festival. If you do get a chance to see Before Dawn, do not pass up on the opportunity. It looks like it's going to be a fantastic movie. Next up, and you just know that a zombie film festival isn't complete without a bit of Italian cheese, it's Nightmare City! Or, as it's also known as, City of the Walking Dead. Not to be confused with City of the Living Dead, this was shown at last year's Zombie Film Fest. Although it's certainly of the same calibre, as in, it's a proper trashy zombie flick with loads of excessive violence and gore, plenty of gratuitous female nudity and some appalling acting and dialogue. 
A military plane makes an emergency landing and opens its doors to reveal dozens of bloodthirsty zombies who go on a violent rampage. It's left to one television news reporter to save the world, you know, as you do, along with his constantly screaming missus, who may as well be a zombie warning siren. Good job he's armed with an exploding telly then. In Nightmare City, the zombies are not only capable of intelligent thought, but are even proficient in using weapons and driving cars. Although it is rather odd that the zombies here basically look like they've been dipped in dog shit. Or decided to lay down underneath a cow. Oh my god, it's the attack of the atomic shit-faced zombies! What's also weird is that the makeup and gore effects differ from one part of the film to the next. There's a strange mix of deaths that are really obviously mimed, and mimed really badly I should add, alongside full-on gore shots with blood spraying everywhere. In fact, nearly everything differs from one minute to the next. One minute the zombies are getting shot, stabbed, and smacked over the head with blunt objects, and they don't have a care in the world. The next minute, they're in unbelievable agony because someone slammed their fingers in a door. What? I think it's safe to say that these zombies are proper perverts as well, as almost every lady in the film gets their top ripped open before they're killed. There's also a couple of breast stabbings, and one unfortunate lassie even gets a boob cut off. Ouch! Also, like in Burial Ground and Zombie Flesh Eaters, Nightmare City feels the need to stick in an eye-puncher scene. Mm. It's almost as if the Italian film directors were looking at each other and saying, well, if he's done that, then I'm going to do it as well. At one point, our surviving hero stop off at a roadside cafe for a coffee and to give us a heavy-handed debate concerning mankind's arrogant abuse of the environment. Are you shitting me? Quit your yapping, stick some more petrol in your car and keep driving before the infected shitheads arrive. And of course we get the ending, which reveals that it was a dream all along. I suppose the title of the movie is a clue, really. But then, when a certain military plane has to make an emergency landing... Well, they could have ended the film there with you wondering, well, does it happen again? But amazingly, they have the gall to just splash the nightmare becomes reality across the screen in huge bold letters and completely ruin the suspense. So we're just finished off with Nightmare City now, which is notorious for its shitty ending, which may or may not have inspired the idea for Groundhog Day. Um, maybe not. But uh, yeah, what we've just seen there is an attack of the atomic shit-faced zombies. Always a good thing. Now coming up is going to be the big surprise, Don Mac have kept this a, a, a secret up until today. The next film, and it fills my manhood with pride to say this, is going to be Peter Jackson's quintessential zombie epic, Brain Dead. I can't wait to see this on the big screen. So yes, next up, Brain Dead, also known as Dead Alive. Overbearing mother's boy Lionel takes the pretty girl who works in the shop round the corner off to the local zoo. This might not seem like much, but to Lionel, this is a big moment for him, as it means that he gets to untie himself from his mother's apron strings for a few hours. Or does he? Well, unfortunately not, as his mother is actually hiding in the bushes nearby to try and sabotage their date. Unfortunately for her, she gets a little bit too close to a cage that contains a particularly nasty creature, which is some sort of rat-monkey hybrid. Hmm, cute little bugger, isn't he? Lionel takes his mother home to nurse the savage bite she received, although the rat monkey itself has been taken out of the picture altogether, courtesy of the heel of Lionel's mother's shoe. Despite his efforts, the following morning, the bite wound has gone from, ooh, that looks a bit sore, to completely fucking nasty. Despite this, Lionel's mother still insists on having lunch with the Hendersons as planned, and ends up committing the social faux pas of dropping her ear in the custard, which she promptly eats. Not to mention squirting a big dollop of red pus into the bowl of custard that Mr. Henderson is eating from, which she eats without even noticing. Mmm, damn fine custard, he remarks in a proud and happy voice. From there, we learn that in addition to a steady diet of human flesh, zombies have, well, other certain urges as well, which can then lead to the birth of a demonic-looking zombie baby. We also learn that whilst the priest is supposed to be a kind-hearted soul, he will not hesitate to, 
and I quote, kick ass for the Lord. So Lionel's life becomes a living nightmare, as everything from ninja priests to zombie babies are brought into the equation, with Lionel trying to keep it all hidden away from the outside world. But when Uncle Les uncovers Lionel's collection of cadavers in the basements, he realises that he has to put a stop to this madness. Unfortunately, the poison he uses on his zombified mum, along with all of the other dead heads, has an animal stimulant in there that is the equivalent of making the zombies turbocharged. The following 20 minutes sees a number of people departing with such possessions as their rib cages, legs and faces, as the zombies go on an insanely gruesome rampage, whilst Uncle Les goes completely apeshit with a couple of meat cleavers. But that's just all building up to the finale, where Lionel takes on all of the zombies whilst armed with a lawnmower strapped to his body, in one of the most splatterific moments ever committed to the silver screen. Oh, and Lionel has to face off against his mum one last time to finally break free from her. By the way, Lionel's mum is now a massive zombie beast, for some reason, and it turns out that she was responsible for the death of Lionel's own father, back when he was a child. And as if enough blood and guts haven't been sprayed around enough in this movie already, about two truckloads of the stuff pour out of the zombie beast, as Lionel is literally reborn. Which, between this scene and the final scene in Bad Taste, seems to be a continuing theme in Peter Jackson's movies. Oh, so the last, so the mystery film on was Brain Dead, which I'm really happy to see. Um, people say that the Lord of the Rings trilogy was Peter Jackson's finest work. I would strongly disagree with that. Brain Dead is best, by far the greatest thing that he's ever done. It packs in a fantastic amount of gore and humour in there. And of course, Lionel's use of a lawnmower easily beats Ash Williams' chainsaw hand and Evil Dead 2, I'll tell you that for nothing. One of the sickest, slickest, goriest, and not to mention funniest, zombie movies ever made. Now we're going to finish off the night with Zombieland, so it's time to get some Twinkies out. Next up on the chopping block, Zombieland. Four survivors of a zombie apocalypse take an extended road trip across the southwest in an attempt to find a sanctuary free from the shuffling deadheads. One of these survivors just happens to be a twinky loving badass played by Woody Harrelson, and he isn't going to let anything stand in the way of his favourite chocolate covered treat. There's a box of Twinkies in that grocery store. Not just any box of Twinkies, the last box of Twinkies that anyone will enjoy in the whole universe. Believe it or not, Twinkies have an expiration date. Someday very soon, life's little Twinkie gauge is going to go empty. Time to nut up or shut. He's partnered up with a nerdy teenager who'd spent most of his time eating pizza and playing on World of Warcraft before the infection started spreading. The only reason why he survived this long is because of the rules he has learnt along the way, which he continues to follow to a T. Rule number one, cardio. You gotta learn how to run like fuck. And don't go shitting somewhere where you can get trapped like a bathroom. And oh yeah, don't be stingy with the bullets. Double tap, baby. So if it's not enough that these two guys, polar opposites of each other, have to stick together, but then they join up with a couple of sisters who want to visit a theme park and have some fun. Which is a stupid fucking idea, really, considering that it's established earlier on in the film that the zombies are attracted to music and lights. The first two thirds of the movie are great, then it just starts to get really dumb when they get to the theme park. But this is a comedy at the end of the day, and it doesn't get dark like some of the other zombie movies being shown at the festival. It's a solid mix of horror and comedy, and whilst you can't really compare it to Shaun of the Dead, this is probably the closest that America has come to making a movie like this. All I can say is that if you love zombie movies, and you like a few laughs to go with your gore and guns, then you'll have a good time in Zombieland. It's starting to flag a bit with the last one, but uh, glad I kept awake for it, because it is Zombieland, it's a fantastic movie. It has the best opening sequence to a movie ever. 
not to mention it has, I mean, it's already a good movie to start off with, but then we get a cameo appearance from a certain Ghostbuster, and that just elevates it to legendary status. If you've not seen Zombieland before, I won't spoil because of that cameo, but I'm pretty much giving it away with that. But it's definitely worth checking out. So, that is another zombie film festival that we've done and dusted. Um, what's been as I like to think of uh, this year's? I don't know. Uh, maybe Pontypool. Pontypool, Pontypool was, a, was an unexpected surprise, wasn't it? Nightmare City. Brilliant. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, so, oh, and then being told we got bra yeah, getting brain dead as well, which we didn't, we didn't find out until the day. So yeah. fantastic. So this is the Big Daddy D signing off for another Leeds Zombie Film Festival, um, and we'll catch you again next year. <laughs> it is quite satisfying actually. <laughs> <laughs> when you were a kid, painting the, you know, the sort of wood that you had at school. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>